Hello, fair maidens. Today's teaching is called Persecuting His Prophets. Um, this teaching has within it three dreams and their interpretations. And Father speaks to us in numerous ways. And one of the ways he prepares me for devotionals is by giving me dreams. And just like Joseph said to Pharaoh, so I say the interpretation is of the Lord. Just like the Word of God that is multidimensional, so at times are the dreams that he gives us and can have multiple messages within them. The following dream has multiple messages, but considering and in conjunction with the next dream, I will only share the, the uh, applicable message for this devotional. Before I share the dream, it's important to lay this foundational understanding that the church is built upon the teachings of the apostles and prophets, a reference to the Old Testament. However, this is also true with regard to his true apostles and prophets since the resurrection, even now, who are given to the church for that express purpose to exhort, equip, break down and build up the church until it has reached maturity in Christ. Added to that, the intent of God for the church herself as a whole is that she is an apostolic and prophetic entity specifically to the Jews first and to the world. Who we are and how we live is a message and we become the epistles, the letters that others read. Your life is a scroll for others to read. So this devotional teaching is about the persecution that will come, enduring under and through that persecution, and also to, as Paul says, examine yourself whether you are in the faith. This is all to prepare us as workers. Now, the first dream that Father gave me, um, I'll call it the dream of the wooden spoon. I dreamt that I was responsible for groups of men consisting of different ages. These groups consisted of young boys, young men, and then more mature men. It was time to rest, and I told them to sit in their groups on their couches. The young boys immediately fell asleep, whilst the other groups were as typical naughty children bumping against each other and disobeying me. I warned them that they would wake up the little ones, but they kept ignoring me. I could see that they were not going to listen. I became very angry at this outright disobedience and I went to my kitchen to get my wooden spoon. This wooden spoon is very big and in fact looks more like a paddle than a spoon. I actually use the spoon to tenderize my meat for cooking. So in other words, I truly use it to hit and not to stir. So I went back to where they were and saw two men sitting at a table as if I've never told them that uh, they needed to go sleep, as if it's not applicable to them. And I asked them why they were not resting as I told them to. And when they saw my wooden spoon, they immediately got up and went to their couches. I then went to another room where I saw the younger men playing and goofing around. They saw me and I lifted up my spoon and angrily said, you want to behave like children, then I will treat you like children. Suddenly, the scene changes and I saw myself lying on the floor with my head on a man's lap. I at first looked not to him, but to what was in his hands and right in front of my face. So he was holding green grapes and crushing them until the flesh of the grapes came out. I looked up at him and saw that he was very attractive, with fair skin, beautiful piercing blue eyes, and I guess he was probably maybe about in his early 40s. He was bald. All I knew was that I loved him and that I was going to marry him. I woke up from this dream at exactly 5.45, and Strong's 5.45 means uh, disobedient, and it also means pillar, foster father, and mother. So this is the interpretation of this dream. This dream is a warning dream. It's a warning to his prophets, and it's a warning to those who disobey them. Firstly, why did Father direct my attention to Strong's meaning of 545? The reason is that it merely serves as a confirmation and context for my dream. 
Strong's 545, meaning disobedient, points to the disobedient children in my dream. Also, it points to those who are of the fivefold ministry, being apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors, who are the shepherds or the fathers and mothers of the faith. That's the other meaning of Strong's 545. They are responsible to look after his children. And in this dream, I am a mother of these groups. And you will find that this was the call to Ezekiel when God told him that they would not listen to him. Nevertheless, God still sent him. And in the same way, the workers will be sent into the harvest field during the tribulation. So let's, let's read that of Ezekiel's call. That's in Ezekiel 2, verse 3 to 7. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. It's important to know that in this dream I represent not only a mother, but I am also in the prophetic office. The warning of the dream is his judgment on the disobedient children who ignore his prophets. Being in this office, I can tell you that being ignored is really one of the hardest things to endure. And this is not because of insecurity on my side, but because I know that in the end, he is not being heard. Much goes into a word from the Lord before it can be spoken. A prophet becomes a message before he or she gives the message. There is an investment from God into the prophet and the prophet into God. This means that often they have to endure hardship that others are not subject to. Ezekiel was told to eat the scroll that had written on it lamentation, mourning and woes. He had to allow it to become part of him and take it into his bowels. Prophets are made subject to suffering. Therefore the school they go to is called suffering. Ananias was told by God to go and pray for Paul and tell him the great things he must suffer for his name's sake. Then, later we read of how Paul expresses his desire to share in the fellowship of his sufferings in Philippians 3.10 in order to know him. Now, where the teacher is to bring the revelation of the word of God, the prophet is to bring the revelation of the heart of God. Sharing in his suffering is no light thing to him who poured his soul out unto death as an offering for sin. Subjecting his servants to this suffering so that they may express his heart to his rebellious children is no light thing to him. And when you touch his prophets, you touch him because they are chosen to endure much hardship in order to know his heart and be his mouthpiece to warn his children. Just as his suffering was the ultimate expression of his love for his bride, so their willingness to suffer in order to know him more is an ultimate expression of their love for him. He is fiercely jealous over them. So please note that there is a vast difference between the office of a prophet and the gift of prophecy. Anyone can have a gift of prophecy as the Spirit moves on them. But those called to the office, their whole life is seen through his eyes, meaning the prophet's whole life is subject to his disposal to be the message itself 
not just the prophetic words. The issue of a prophet is not personal prediction of people's lives. The prophet does not have a say in what God will subject him or her in order to be that message. It's not a picnic to be a prophet. And those who are called to this office understand that nothing in their life is out of bounds when it comes to his dealings with them. Okay, now going now back to the dream. The wooden spoon that is in fact more a paddle is a reference to my authority to judge and bring judgment down as one would do with spanking disobedient children. They refuse to listen to me telling them to rest, which is a reference to walking by faith. And scripture tells us that faith is to enter into his rest and unbelief is disobedience. Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Children of disobedience are children that refuse to live by faith, and therefore do not enter into his rest. We cannot separate obedience and faith. These disobedient children do not receive his promises, neither do they receive his prophets. Now in this dream, the youngest group of boys fell asleep, speaking of having faith like a child. The older we become, the wiser we think we are in our own understanding and knowledge. Thinking ourselves wise, we are in fact foolish and disobedient. We know better, and who is this prophet telling us what to do? In my dream, a greater prophet is seen, and whose lap I'm resting on, speaking of my closeness to him and resting in faith. Now this man in my dream represents Elisha, who was said to be bald, At the same time, all the prophets of the Old Testament represent within themselves Yeshua, which is the reason I'm so in love with him and know that I will marry him. Commentaries say that there could have been various reasons why Elisha was bald, not necessarily because he had no hair, but it could have been due to shaving off his hair. Either way, the focus is Elisha. So what happened to Elisha that holds hands with this dream I was given? Well, Elisha was bald and also taunted and mocked by little children. They called him Baldy and told him to go up. This going up was a reference to Elijah who was caught up, raptured within a whirlwind. He often have God's mouthpiece been mocked for their belief in the rapture. Well, it will be according to your faith. During the tribulation, The warning from those workers to the world and his disobedient children will be that he will be coming in great wrath and they are to make ready and repent. But just like most did not adhere to the Son of Man, so many will not hear again and will persecute them. Just like they did with Noah, asking where the promised rain was. Studies I've shown that these little children taunting Elisha is actually wrongly translated and actually means boys and men of different ages. And in my dream, there are boys or men of different ages. Elisha became very angry and cursed these young children. The moment he did this, two she-bears came and killed 42 of the little children. I have a suspicion that these two she-bears represent the two witnesses that will call down the fire on the children of disobedience. In Revelation 13.5 we read that the Antichrist will trample the saints underfoot for 42 months. You reap what you sow and here we have where the two she-bears will kill 42 little children. The two prophets or two witnesses will be given 42 months to make it unbearable for those on the earth as well desiring to kill them. So I have a suspicion that these two she-bears represent the two witnesses that will call down fire on the children of disobedience. But of course this needs further study. The day after this dream I saw a YouTube short with a bear coming into someone's yard. So there's no coincidence there. Now to the grapes. The grapes were green. And this was my first question. Why green grapes? I believe the green grapes are a reference 
to the immaturity of the boys and men I reprimanded. Like rebellious teenagers, the green grapes speak of immaturity, being stiff-necked and bitter. The inner part of a grape is called the flesh of the grape. So he's crushing them, which simply points to dealing with their flesh and that he will not take it lightly when anyone comes against or ignores his true prophets. He will crush them in the tribulation, which is what the crushing of the grapes refer to. All I have to do is lay in his lap whilst he takes care of business. His striking blue eyes point to seeing in the spirit or things of the spirit, just like all prophets are privileged to do. As a whole, you can see that this dream is to remind us that as we will be sent out, many will not listen and we will be disregarded, but he will deal with them. Okay, so let's go over to the next dream. This dream is about a Jezebel spirit. This dream falls in line with the Elisha dream. It's very short. I was standing in my kitchen and there was a blonde woman who was washing my dishes. I could see that she was washing my plates. I was standing about three to four meters from her, watching her. Suddenly, in a split second, she threw a white teacup at me, heading straight to my eye. I quickly jerked away, with, and with that jerk, I woke up. With my heart racing, I knew I had to check the time. And this was exactly at 7.15 a.m. And strong 715 is a word that means bear. So Father was connecting this dream with the Elisha dream, the interpretation of this dream. More often than not, whenever Father gives me a dream of a blonde woman, I know it speaks of the spirit of Jezebel. Now, I've got nothing against blondes, but the white hair speaks of the appearance of innocence or purity, when in fact it is the opposite. It was also Jezebel who persecuted Elijah, which is a type and shadow of the spirit of the age that will persecute his prophets during the tribulation. So I want to remind you again that the church is the apostolic and prophetic entity within this world who will be persecuted just like all the prophets that have gone before us. The spirit of Jezebel is a principality. It's a very strong religious spirit, all connected to the prophets of Baal and false worship. And of course, it is a murderous spirit. It's the same spirit that killed his prophets. And it's the same spirit that worked through all the Pharisees and others who crucified our Lord, falsely accusing him. In Acts 9 verse 1, we read of Saul who was said was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. So you will remember that Yeshua told the Pharisees that they are whitewashed tombs. He also told them not to focus so much on cleaning the cup on the outside, but that they needed to clean it on the inside as well. This is what the white teacup thrown to me in my dream points to. A kitchen speaks of food, and in my case, what I teach and the prophetic words Father gives me. So mostly my teachings are in fact about cleaning the cup on the inside, that's to say the heart. The woman throwing the teacup at me and aiming it at my eye is Father saying that the enemy will use that which I say against me and also target my dreams and visions. A prophet is also the eyes of God. So I guess... I'm just not her cup of tea. Washing my dishes is to look for anything that can be used against me. You can see how this dream holds hands with the previous one, not to mention the time I woke up at 7.15, which means bear linking it to Elisha. The Pharisees and scribes are known in scripture for three things that make up this religious spirit, which are pride, hypocrisy and murder. So just an interesting note here, I was subjected to much suffering in the making of this teaching. And in this suffering, he came to share his heart with me. I understood that what he subjected me to was to know what he was subjected to. And in feeling that and entering into that suffering, 
caused my heart to grow bitter towards the person Father used in this suffering in my life. My heart grew hard towards this person, not because of what was done unto me, but fully understanding what this has done to the one I love. And one night, as I was about to go sleep, I realized that my left eye was tearing a lot. I noticed that my cheek was sensitive to the touch. This meant that I had infection in my mouth and it was affecting my eye. Knowing that he uses all things to speak to me, I realized that it was the same eye the cup was directed to in my dream. The next day, my husband bought himself a very big bottle of mouthwash and offered to give me half of it. It was then that the spirit reminded me that even though he suffered so much, no guile was found in his mouth. And this is a warning unto us to know that when we suffer the many things to come, offenses will come. But we are to guard our hearts against guile because it will affect our eyes, which is to say our seeing. Offense will be a very big obstacle in the time to come. When John the Baptist, a picture of the Elijah company, was found in prison with his head about to be chopped off, questioning, whether Yeshua was the one sent, Yeshua said to John's disciples to say to him, Blessed are those who are not offended in me. If we do not guard against this, our perspective and eyes will be upon those who harm us and not on him. How easily this is the case in our day-to-day -day living where we place more onus on God's messenger, the thorn, than on God. What lies at the heart of both of these dreams is questioning the authority given unto the prophet, thereby questioning what is said. The Pharisees constantly questioned Yeshua's doctrine and said that he was out to deceive people. In the same way, the wooden spoon in my dream represents my authority. When Aaron, Moses' mouthpiece, cast down his rod before Pharaoh, the magicians cast theirs down as well. All the rods turned into snakes. And Yeshua and John the Baptist called the Pharisees adders and asps. In Exodus 7, it clearly states that the rod of Aaron ate up the rod of the magicians. Now, it would have made sense to say the snake of Aaron ate up the snakes of the magicians, but it specifically said the rod ate up their rods, meaning the authority given to God to Moses is greater than the authority of the magicians or the Pharisees. They may be able to do miracles and great things, turning water into blood as well, but in the end, the source of authority is not God. Furthermore, the dishes in this dream being washed represent my teachings. Throwing the cup to my eye represents attacking the office in itself, just like the Pharisees did with Yeshua, saying that there has never been a prophet from Galilee, and how Yeshua says in John 4.44, being in Galilee, that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So both the office and the teaching are being attacked. In Luke 11, Yeshua addresses the Pharisees, the religious system. Then he addresses the scribes, which is the worldly knowledge and understanding, all that the world represents, humanism. And then the lawyers, which is the governmental or judicial system of the world. In other words, he was not only addressing them individually, but also the world system, which is the word cosmos in the Greek. So please keep in mind when reading the following scriptures that Yeshua was addressing first and foremost a system under which this world is held in bondage or enslaved. These scriptures are taken from the Amplified Bible. Let's read from Luke 11 verse 39. First the religious system. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and plate as required by tradition. Okay, so this would be the woman washing my dishes and throwing the cup at me in my dream. And then he says, But inside you are full of greed and wickedness. 
right? The love of money is the root of all evil. Verse 40, you foolish ones, acting without reflection or intelligence, did not he who made the outside make the inside also, but rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean to you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you have to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets. So we've got money, pride, and tradition are addressed in these few verses. At the heart of it lies hypocrisy, because they have the appearance of godliness, but within their heart there is greed and wickedness. This is true from the pulpit of the Vatican to the pulpit of your local church to that which you see on YouTube or other platforms right into your home where those who say they love the Lord actually loves the world. Through tradition, slaves are made. And whether that bondage is at home or whether it's through ministry, the ultimate result is slavery. Whatsoever and whomsoever we obey, it or he is our master and we the slave. This is religious slavery, much like a cult, but not that obvious for the undiscerning eye. These are those who through tradition desire to control and become rich, enslave and traffic with God's children for their own gain. They live double lives, and where some are aware of it, having malicious intent, others believe they are doing the work of God. They are deceived and deceive many. Some of God's precious children are held captive, just like trafficked children behind bars. They are sold at a price and are only a commodity to serve the enemy's purpose, which is to control the masses. Okay, let's go to the other part of the system, the worldly wisdom and humanism. Verse 44, Yeshua says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as graves which appear not, you can't see it, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. In Proverbs 9, we have two women. This, The first part of Proverbs 9 talks about wisdom as a woman who has hewn her seven pillars and has set a table inviting those who are simple and wise to come and eat from her table. The seven pillars represent the seven churches. Wisdom here is the Spirit of God and the church is invited to come to the Spirit and receive wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. Now, in contrast to her, there is another woman in Proverbs 9 who sits in high places at the gate, making sure that everyone immediately notes her. She has stolen water and she has also prepared her bed for the foolish to come in, to come and lie with her, saying that what she offers is much sweeter and better. Let's read that. That's from Proverbs 9 verse 16 to 18. She says, Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her gates or her guests are in the depths of hell. Now, of course, we can see this in relation to sexual immorality and adultery, but the focus here is those who want understanding pointing to spiritual adultery. Two women, therefore two wisdoms, are being compared. The one brings forth life, and the other leads to the depths of hell. It's in fact an open grave. The scribes in verse 44 work together with the Pharisees in digging these graves for those they teach. It's not only that of tradition, but also represents the wisdom of this world. It's amazing uh, when we place the letters doctor or PhD or whatever other letters before or after someone's name, how we start to speak respectfully to them. Please do not misunderstand me. 
I do realize that one is to give honor where honor is due, but the truth is that we today lay more weight to man's degrees, wisdom and understanding than that of the Spirit of God who is wisdom. Luke was a doctor and Paul, a learned and acclaimed Pharisee, make no mistake, they saw their own folly and knew that it counted for nothing and counted it all down for the excellency of knowing and obtaining Christ. We tend to place the wisdom of man above the wisdom of God. This path is an open grave and shows our dependency on this world and its wisdom. It's a system that enslaves. God uses doctors and those with PhDs, but they are subject to God and not the other way around. How quick are you to run to Dr. Google? Do you first run to wisdom that has prepared a table for you? Or do you first run to the foolish woman with her stolen waters? Humanism lies at the heart of worldly wisdom and has married itself with the occult. Psychology stems from the Greeks who were the heart of humanism and through the years occult practices were introduced. These were the very forces Paul addressed in Athens when he went to the synagogues in Acts 17 and he told them that he would tell them who the unknown God was they were serving. This all enslaves not only the masses with lies and deception but also makes them addicted to medication. God uses medication. And he uses herbs, herbs, but it is man that has come and defiled it in order for their own gain. We know how the love of money lies at the heart of this system. This world system is built on the basis of commerce, whether the souls of men or any other commodity. Satan traffics with the souls of men. When Yeshua spoke to the scribes, the focus was this world's wisdom as a system that leads to death. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 19 to 20, Paul says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Then in the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5 to 7 and 12 to 13, we read that your faith, your trust, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Albeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Verse 12 and 13. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay, now the governmental or judicial system, Luke 11 verse 45 to 49. One of the lawyers, an expert in Mosaic law, answered him, Teacher, so now he's being all lawyery with him, Teacher, by saying this, you insult us too. But he said, Woe to you lawyers as well, because you weigh men down with burdens, man-made rules, unreasonable requirements, which are hard to bear, and you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with your fingers to lighten the load. Woe to you, for you repair or build tombs for the prophets, and it was your fathers who killed them. So you are witnesses and approve the deeds of your fathers, because they actually killed them, and you repair or build their tombs. For this reason also the wisdom of God said in the scriptures, I will send them prophets and apostles, some whom they will put to death, and some they will persecute. Now, Coming back to where the church, specifically the workers during the tribulation, being an apostolic and prophetic entity, Yeshua said the following in Luke's discourse in chapter 21, 
verse 12 to 17, it says, But before all these, because they wanted to know the signs of the end, before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you to, uh, for a testimony. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall, they, they shall cause to put to death and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. So just so you know, these are absolutes. You will be hated by all men for his as name's sake, and you will be cast into prisons and or put to death. You don't have to wonder about this. It's as clear as daylight. The real issue is whether you will be able to stand. The real issue is to endure. Then going straight to verse 50 and 51, so that the charges may be brought against this generation holding them responsible for the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of this world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah the priest, who was murdered between the altar and the house of God. Yes, I tell you, charges will be brought against this generation. Which generation is Yeshua referring to? He's referring to the last generation of the tribulation who had the writings of the Old and New Testament serving as an indictment against them and their rebellion against God. Not only the writings, but they have hardened their hearts against his true apostles and prophets and would not adhere to their warnings. God is not taking the persecution of his chosen ones Likely. He will show mercy to those who have shown mercy and show himself froward to those who are froward. Verse 52 Woe to you, lawyers, because you have taken away the key to knowledge, scriptural truth. You yourselves did not enter, and you held back those who were entering by your flawed interpretation of God's word and your man made tradition. So this can be seen both in the context of Mosaic law, that enslaves, therefore not entering into his rest, but also the judicial system of this world that through laws enslaves mankind, all because of greed. Verse 53 of Luke 11. When he left there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to be very hostile towards him and to interrogate on many subjects plotting against him to catch him in something he might say. So one can say that they were doing his dishes, just like my dream. Now I want to come back to the first dream together with the meaning of the second by referring to Numbers 14. Numbers 14 is where the Israelites murmured against Moses and Aaron, both prophets. Murmuring is complaining and grumbling. And in Hebrews 3 and 4, it tells us that this is unbelief. They could not inherit the rest of God due to their unbelief. In the same way, the rebellious children in my dream were supposed to rest, but refused, meaning they did not believe. Therefore, they will not enter into his rest and will not inherit the promised land. Not only that, but they will experience his wrath. Unbelief is one of the reasons why prophets are not adhered to. Who is required to believe? His children. We cannot expect the world to believe. In my dream, the children are disobedient and cannot enter into his rest. Unbelief comes because of various reasons. Amongst them is the inability to endure hardship. This is seen in the type and shadow of the murmuring of the Israelites in the desert, losing sight of the promise of God of the land of milk and honey. How often have we heard you have been saying for so long that he's coming as soon and still nothing. 
Hearts grow hard because of unbelief. And this is where bitterness sets in. When the heart grows hard, the conscience begins to grow more and more insensitive to the promptings of the Spirit's warnings. This is not just about disappointment in Him for not coming when we would like Him to, but also how long we often are subjected to suffering, feeling as if He has forsaken us. Life becomes unbearable and we want a break, something to help us to continue. And this is where, because of the seared conscience, the flesh that hates God starts to dominate and control the spirit. More and more compromises are made. The more compromises are made, the more the conscience becomes seared to the point where this person is given over to their sin. We wonder how someone who once loved the Lord so much can become so callous towards him and turn away from him. This is how. It starts with offense. People do not have the stomach for suffering and their flesh cries out for relief and slowly they start to compromise whilst their conscience becomes more seared with each act of disobedience. This is written in Romans 1 for us to understand that those who will come against us are those very people we never would have thought would do so. They will not only be of this world, but those disobedient children who, like the followers of Christ in John 6 verse 66, who no longer followed him, will turn away. In Romans 1, Paul confirms what Yeshua said about this last generation that will be held accountable for all the prophets' deaths from the very first to the last. Let's read that. Romans 1 verse 18 to 19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They know God, and they knew the truth, and ultimately, because they held the truth in unrighteousness, the word says the wrath of God will be revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Nobody will be able to say, we did not know. Let's go to verse 28 to 32 of Romans 1. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Wow, what a description of this generation we are in who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. God will avenge his prophets and his servants. He will crush them like grapes, those who come against them. During the trumpet period of the tribulation, he will send the two witnesses that will be as she bears to answer with fire. Why she bears? Because it speaks of a mother bear's anger towards those who have robbed her of her children, the prophets. Precious is the blood of the saints to our God. In Romans 2 verse 5 to 9, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath 
against the day of wrath. Now, speaking about this generation that I just described, they are treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor, immorality, eternal life. That's what they will get. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Their literal deeds of unrighteousness are wrath that they are storing up to be poured out on them. They are investing into God's wrath, indignation, Wrath, tribulation, and anguish is their due. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1 to 4 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers or covenant breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Listen to this part. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. They have a form of godliness. The word form is Strong's G3446, and it's the Greek word morphosis. It means to form, shape, or the word appearance. Remembering that I said that the religious spirit is that of hypocrisy. I'm sure you can see how this is applicable to those even within our own households or family that have the appearance of godliness. But you know it's all a lie. They appear godly before others in order to hide their sins. That's the only reason for the form of godliness. They clean the cup on the outside, but inside it's filled with greed and wickedness. It's filled with their aspirations and dreams for their life, how to make money, how to expand on their business ideas and even aspiring for ministry. It's really more of how to get the best of this or that. They still cover the things of this world and even go so far as to justify their lusts with the word of God. In fact, they traffic with God to cover their sins. They're no different than the Prosperity teachers and slick false prophets who sell the gospel at a price, pocketing the flock's money with empty promises. Where the false teachers and prophets use the pulpit to sell the gospel, those who have the form of godliness buy into this world by justifying themselves with scripture taken out of context. They have learned the right language to be able to sit amongst true Christians and say just the right thing to come off as a true Christian. It's all lies and deception. And the result of this, should that person not repent, is a reprobate mind who will be given over to his or her sins. They think that because they pray every now and then that they and God are still good. Whilst all the while, their prayers have become an abomination unto him. And in fact, wrath is being stored up for the tribulation where the masks, the appearances, will be ripped off and they will be found to be snakes and adders. I said earlier, the prophet first becomes the message. I'm presently in such a relationship even to the point of nausea. I physically feel sick and want nothing to do with this person. And it is here where the Spirit reminded me of the Laodicean church, which is the church age we are now presently in. Let's just quickly read that. Revelation 3, 14 to 17. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. See, it's got to do with deception here. The faithful and true witness is now speaking to them that are false. He's saying, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou would cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, you have the form of godliness, and are neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That word spew is vomit. 
because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eyesalve, that thou mayest see. You see, it's a reprobate mind that thinks he is clothed whilst being naked. A reprobate mind that thinks he can see when he's actually blind. A reprobate mind that considers the riches of this world as gain, but in fact is terribly poor. These people do not only lie to themselves and believe it, but they also lie to God. They convince themselves that they are right with God, that all is fine and that they can teach others. They convince themselves that with what they have constitute God's favor. They secretly believe that they do not need God, whilst confessing that they do. This is having a form of godliness while denying the power thereof. That is holding the truth in unrighteousness. Like Ananias and Sapphira, they give in part whilst confessing that they give the whole. They lie to the Spirit of God and traffic with God's children. They are nothing but liars, fornicators and adulterers and they love it. And they think that nobody will find them out. They think no one will know and even convince themselves whilst busy with their lewd and despicable acts that God does not see. And he made it clear that that which is done in secret will be shouted on the rooftops. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 to 10 let's read that he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effe effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. We all stand naked before our holy God. And he is saying that they disgust him so much that he wants to vomit them out of his mouth. Their pride has blinded them and like Judas, they've betrayed him. They think that they can get away with their porn under their mattress or their apps on their phones changing their password. They think it's just an innocent conversation with someone across the world that they will never see. Meanwhile, it's a 14-year-old gold girl or younger that has been sold into prostitution, that is a slave to this world system, making them who lust after them a predator. They convince themselves that they're not. They convince themselves that they're not as bad as the pedophiles and drug addicts while secretly harboring lustful thoughts at night, using their wives for the fulfillment of these lusts. And on Sunday morning, at the dinner table, they thank God for his grace and ask him to bless their food. I'm not even talking about the world. I'm talking about those who are Christians, men and women. <sighs> Why am I going into a bit of detail with regard to the character and disposition of the many Christians of this generation? Because these are the very people whose hearts have grown cold and will be of those of your own household it will give you up to the authorities and cast you into prison. The enemy has brought a Trojan horse within the church in order to lie, steal and destroy from the inside. Whilst professing to be Christians, they are in fact enemies of God. John, 1 John 2, 15-18 reads, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, it is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, 
but he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. Little children, it is the last time, and as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come, and now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. You see, whilst everybody is looking out for the Antichrist, few are aware of the Antichrist spirit even within the church. Neatly veiled behind the religious mask, this Jezebel spirit is waiting for its perfect moment to rear its ugly serpent head and kill God's children. And just as Christ has a body, so the copycat has one too. The Antichrist body consists of those Christians who have the name of Judas written on their forehead. Like Judas, they were with him. He has walked with Judas, loved Judas and even washed his feet. He must have often prayed for Judas, knowing that he was the son of perdition that was prophesied about. And how his heart must have broken when the day came and he dipped his bread with him and Satan entered into Judas. It was in that moment when the King of Glory, the firstborn of God, was sold for 30 shekels. Judas trafficked God's son. And so many Judases will traffic God's children. When the going gets tough, the moment will rise when the Antichrist spirit will enter them and they will deny him for 30 shekels, which is the Christ in you. These are the children of disobedience who are stiff-necked and are in fact children of the devil. They've gone from being backslidden to outright given over to the flesh, only hidden behind a religious garb. I ask, Father, at what point does a black, a backslidden child become your enemy? His answer, when they deny me, reminding me of Judas. Paul says that those who were once with them and no longer are, were in fact never part of them, speaking of those Christians who turned against them. You see, Judas was all along scheming and being covetous with the money. Money represents the world system, and having a divided eye, the darkness was great within him. He was part of those chosen to follow the Lord, but because his heart was divided, because of offense as seen when Mary broke the expensive alabaster box open in worship to the Lord, there came a moment where he was ripe for the plucking, and Satan entered him. And Yeshua's heartbroken words to him was, have you come to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? How many betray him in worship with a kiss, while secretly loving and depending upon this world? There comes a day when they will be given over to their sin and they will receive a reprobate mind. They persecute his children even now through lying, cheating, stealing and deceiving. They either bind them with tradition or they lure them away from the simplicity of pure devotion. They are always learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Considering themselves wise, they are foolish, blind and make those who follow them twice the children of the devil. Young baby Christians become their target and feed their pride and sense of importance. Do you really think that God will stand idly by and watch this happen to those he bought with his very own blood? Let me share with you a word Father gave me in 2020. It's called Vengeance is Mine. For those who continue in their sin, there is an eternal lake of fire preserved. But those who call upon me, those who repent of their sins, I will be as a father that snatches away his only child from the coming wrath to come. Fear not, my children, for I am for you and not against you. Those whom I've called are mine. I've called you and nobody will snatch you from my hands. Woe to those who cause any of these little ones to fall. For it will truly be better for them to bind a millstone around their neck. Seek me while there is still time. Who can prevent my hand in this coming hour? My vengeance is hot against those who refuse to turn and seek only their own pleasure 
and serve their own hearts, who refuse to bow in humble submission to I am. I come, and with me I bring not mercy, but wrath. Have I not said I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy? Yet mankind has scorned my mercy as one who scorns a vile thing. So I too will scorn them as a vile thing. Depart from me, I know you not. Even though so much time has passed, even though my prophets have warned, still they harden their heart and refuse to repent. I will not repent of my wrath, but pour it out on this earth as rain from the sky. Where mercy was daily poured forth, my wrath will come. The time to seek me and repent is now. Turn, turn, turn from your sin, for I am holy. In a time where I was to be found by those who seek me, they did not. They will cry, why hast thou forsaken me, when it was they who had forsaken me? Vengeance is mine, and I will repay. Repent, and I will save you from the wrath to come. In Matthew 18, verse 6 to 9, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy offense Thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. You see, this chapter is not about little children in the sense of the children coming to the Lord whom he blessed. Though they are most precious to him, he was actually referring to the children of God. He starts by saying in the first verse how offenses will come, but woe to those through whom the offense come. Then he names three things that causes them to err. Their eye, hand, and foot. These three points to that which is of the world. The lust of the eyes which is their devotion, the lust of the flesh, that would be the deeds, and the pride of life, that would be their walk. There are no half measures here. Cut it off. That's how serious this is. So I will now share another dream with you that holds hands with this. In this dream, you will see the process by which the enemy lures them to finally ensnare them. Now, whilst this dream will speak to how the enemy uses the things of the world to ensnare those who will in the end rise up against us and persecute us, it also serves as a warning to us who find ourselves still looking to this world for comfort. We are to judge ourselves lest we find ourselves depending on this world as the children of disobedience does. So let me explain. The night before this dream, my daughter, out of the blue, brought up the subject of how she feels guilty about a certain app she indulges in and how she knows that she must give it up. She feels that it's her last bit of joy in this world that she's clinging to and she's really struggling giving it up. She's afraid that when she does, she will fall into a pit of depression and that it is helping her to keep going. I turned to her and I said, how do you know? that the little bit of joy you are holding on to is not actually the source of your depression. How do you know that even though it gives you a temporary dopamine spike, that it's actually that which casts you into depression afterwards? She could only agree. The joy is not lasting. Having said that, you will then understand the dream I will share now and how we are to examine our hearts and ask ourselves what we depend upon when the going gets tough. If we cannot handle the suffering he divinely allows now in our lives, how will we handle the suffering to come? Okay, this dream is about an anaconda. So I was standing outside on a stage 
that was very high with other people looking at a show of acrobats jumping from one steel pedestal to another. The steel pedestals made me think of these old steel contraptions used for electricity often found in wide open fields. These acrobats were amazing. What they did was humanly impossible and it was as if a current was carrying them from one pedestal to another as they turned in mid-air doing all kinds of stunts. I then climbed down a ladder onto the ground which was a lush wide open green field and I became aware of how thirsty I was. I mean I was really thirsty and had a high heel shoe in my hand. There was water in the shoe and I was drinking from the shoe. I was extremely thirsty and drank deep gulps from the shoe. I was somehow not getting enough water and turned the shoe around. Suddenly, I was on very dry ground and I realized I was at the back of my house. Now, this house was not any house I know of, but in the dream, I knew it was my house. To my left, I spotted a humongous brown anaconda. All I knew was that I had to prevent it from um, going into my house. And I tried to get ahead of it, but it kept gaining ground. I then started to hold stones at it, but soon realized that this only aggravated the snake and it came at me with a vengeance. Soon it caught up with me. And as I ran from it, I saw the top part of the snake turned into a blonde-haired woman and she grasped me and held onto me tenaciously and I could not get away. Okay, so this is the interpretation. The dream is divided into three parts. The air show of the acrobats, the green grass and then the snake incident. The acrobatic show takes place in the air. Even the stage I was standing on was above the ground and it represents the show the enemy puts on for us. It was all acrobats doing the impossible as we watch what is humanly impossible. We are ensnared by what we see. They are carried by air currents and all this is pointing to the prince of the air who has blinded the world. This is the lust of the eyes. Just like Eve was first lured in by what she saw, seeing that the fruit looked good for eating, so the enemy starts with that which is visual. Whether a TV show or those we look to, the point is that lust first starts with what we see. Then our hands follow where what we saw is then brought to action by acting out that lust. The lush green grass I was standing on represents the grass is always greener on the other side. Indeed, although this grass looks beautiful and lush, I was standing there with an immense thirst. This drinking out of the shoe really puzzled me. And then I thought, wait a minute, I bet this is something people do. So I looked it up and sure enough, it's a thing. Drinking out of a shoe signifies the bringer of good fortune. It's interesting to note that the first drinking out of a shoe, known as a shoey, happened in 1902 when someone drank out of a woman's slipper in a brothel. Well, the origin of something sure sets the precedent. Fornicating with this world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life is to drink out of the shoe of this world's brothel and it will always leave you thirsty. The grass may look green and lush, but it will never satisfy and leads to death, which is where the anaconda comes in. In fact, it will lead to dry and barren, to a barren place, which was exactly what the back of my house looked like where I found the snake. And what does the anaconda do? It swallows the prey whole and crushes it. I wanted to prevent the snake from entering my home, knowing clearly that this is dangerous. And I started to try my best to get ahead of it so that I could hurl stones at it, only aggravating it. This is how we are with secret sin. We know it's dangerous and try to get ahead of it. And in our feeble attempts to stop, we only hurl stones. That is to say, quote little scriptures and wonder why it does not work. The problem is that the way one should go ahead or go about is to chop off its head. You cannot control the flesh, 
you have to kill it. And it turned into this blonde woman, which represents the Jezebel spirit that grabbed me and held on to me tenaciously. It was too late. Father gave me this dream right after the conversation with my daughter about the source of her joy, which could not, never satisfy. Not only is the world subject to the seduction of the lust of the eyes, but especially Christians. It's not easy to follow the Lord, because if you really do, you will carry a cross. And the sole purpose of that cross is to die on it, just like our Savior died on His. We know that the cross we bear comes in different forms in our life that we may be sanctified and made holy, dying to this world, to the flesh, and all soulish desires. And frankly, it's very difficult. Yes, it has its joys and the reward is knowing, being close to him and growing into maturity. However, the road is long. Some crosses are for many years some just for a short season, but never is there not a cross. And it's not that we are not willing to carry our cross, but at times it feels like suffering upon suffering. One wave after the other, and the next one always bigger. At times we get our stride, and other times we sink. But giving up is not an option for us. However, every now and then we want some form of relief. We want some pick-me-upper that will help us going. We have given everything up for him. And it feels as if nothing in life is giving us any joy anymore. And this is where our little pet sins comes in. You know, the ones that have been nagging at your conscience. The truth is that we want to escape reality. Even if it's just for that moment. When sadness overwhelms us, we either go for the fridge or pantry or we watch our favorite show. We talk first to our friend or find the urge to down a cup of coffee or tea. Or we grab our favorite chocolate or bag of chips or for those still addicted to cigarettes, we run for that release. Now, do not get me wrong. Lest you fall into a trap of legalism and guilt. This is not Father's focus. Father's focus is to prepare us for the time to come, during which our suffering will be much greater. His focus is on where our dependence is for the ability to endure. To all the seven churches in Revelation was the admonition given to endure. In this world, the whole premise to survive is based on avoiding pain in the pursuit of of happiness. We avoid pain or suffering in many ways and if we allow the Spirit to show us, He will. Father is not against you eating chocolate every now and then or watching a nice movie. That is not what He is getting at. To go now and think you have to cut all these things out of your life is to fall into the trap of legalism. Paul said that all things are permissible to us, but not all things are profitable. The issue is not whether you should or shouldn't do or don't, but it is your disposition towards these things. We think by stopping all these things, it will sort out the problem. It may help for a short while, just like hurling stones at the snake, but because of your disposition towards it, you will still just fall into the trap again. We are to guard our heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. To try and cut off these things is the equivalent of circumcision of the flesh where his focus is the circumcision of the heart. It is the equivalent of having a tree that is rotting and you pluck the fruit instead of bringing the axe to it. Unless that is dealt with, the root you will continue to go down the well-trodden path of temptation to lean on this world in order to endure. Let me explain this to you in another way. We are told that we are to come out of this world, but at the same time, Yeshua prays in John 17 that the Father must not take us out of this world, but keep us from that evil one. We also read of how we are in this world, but not of this world. We are seated in heavenly places with Christ while here on earth, Yeshua told Nicodemus, even though standing right in front of him, that he was with the Father. Not only is this a reality, 
But it requires of us to have a certain perspective and disposition to this world and the world system whilst we are here. Watchman Nee says in his book, Love Not This World, highly recommend it. He says, Thus salvation is not so much a personal question of sins forgiven or a hell avoided. It is to be seen rather in terms of a system from which we come out. When I'm saved, I make my exodus out of one whole world and my entry into another. I'm saved now out of that whole organized realm with which Satan has constructed in defiance of the purpose of God. We have to remember that what lays at the foundation of the correct view or disposition towards this world and its system is that it's under God's judgment, which is a sentence of death. Just like the waters cover this whole earth representing God's judgment on this earth. Just like we were baptized into his death, so the world was baptized under a sentence of death. It's not still needing to die, it's already dead. It may appear alive and well, but this is the illusion and acrobatic show that the enemy is using to keep people ensnared to it. Whosoever we obey, we become a slave to. If you still go to these things that I mentioned to escape the reality of your suffering, then you see these things, just like my daughter, as a source of life. Whilst it's dead. You may not be willing to admit it, but it's true. Because suffering is death, and the flesh cries out for relief, and flesh needs to be fed to survive. And once we see and realize that this world and what it gives is dead and has no ability whatsoever to produce life, peace or joy for that matter, we will not go to it for relief. But the truth is, we do. In one way, we can look at this world and the system as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which Adam and Eve were told they would surely die should they partake of it. How many of his children still live from both trees? If that which is earthly does not die in your eyes, you will forfeit the fullness of what he has in store for you, which includes the call upon your life. It's either a sentence of death upon this world, that snake, or a sentence of death upon his purposes for your life. That needs to be said again. It's either a sentence of death upon this world, that snake, or a sentence of death upon his purposes for your life. The death sentence must be complete in you and in this world. Paul said the following in Galatians 6 verse 14 and 15. He says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. You see, it's about the heart. Watchman Nee says the following. He says, physical separation does not bring about spiritual separation. And the reverse is also true, that spiritual contact with the world does not necessitate spiritual capture by the world. See, it's got to do with the disposition. I am not now talking about outright deliberate sin where it necessitates the plucking out of the eye or the cutting off of the hand and foot. I'm talking about that which is permissible, that we use in order to endure. This is part of how the enemy enslaves us and keeps us on that path of the avoidance of pain. I realize that this is not, an e this is not easy to hear. It's not an easy message. But we have to take into consideration what he's preparing us for. The essential character of this world is satanic and it is the enmity with God. Therefore, those who love this world, the love of the Father is not in them and they are considered an enemy of God. Therefore, those who love this world is an enemy of God. To truly see this is deliverance. When we live from both trees, it causes an ambivalence within us, an eternal internal conflict where we ought to have joy. But we find ourselves frustrated, unfulfilled, and even depressed. The earthly and the divine cannot mix, just like water and oil cannot mix. We coexist to each other where you are just as dead to this world as the world is to you. Please 
Do not be so quick to say, well, nothing in this world pleases me and I'm dead to it. Ask the Spirit to show you on what you depend on to bring you joy or comfort, especially when the going gets tough. It can even be your husband or your wife or friends. Many things we depend upon instead of Him. Coming back to the workers that will be sent out into the tribulation as an apostolic and prophetic entity. We have to know that because of this call, there is a tension that we live under where we are to be separate from this world and how it operates, even legitimate and permissible things, even things which is God-given. We are to be led by the Spirit in all things. And tension has at its center pain. Tension is pain and the whole axiom of this world is the avoidance of pain. This will be the disposition of the lukewarm Christians and baby Christians in the time to come, which we know will be the greatest time of suffering there has ever been from the world began. The workers will be that standard of endurance. And if we now in this light affliction cannot endure, how will we in the time to come? It's not a matter of do's and don'ts, but a matter of teaching yourself to endure. Your life is no longer yours. And therefore that which he now divinely allows you to go through is for two reasons. To strengthen you and to equip those in the time to come. Everything I go through in my life, I see through this lens. Paul said the same. He says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8 to 12, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. For we which live are always, always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, so then... Death worketh in us, but life in you. We are always delivered unto death. That's no small statement. We are sent as sheep to the slaughter amongst the wolves. How we suffer matters. How we die matters. It's no longer about us. And when we still seek for that relief, it's because the pain to us is greater than its purpose. Our suffering becomes our focus and it overwhelms us. By mere human understanding, this can be justified, especially if your suffering is great. But when you are a worker, you should understand and embrace the call to endure, for it is for your survival, for what is to come and to equip his children. We will be sent to the different house churches, underground churches, places of refuge where we are to exhort, encourage and build up his children so that they may endure. Lives are at stake. The whole issue of suffering is weakness, which is an absolute necessity for the power of strength or strength of God to reside over us. The issue of our strength is our dependence. His strength in you is no greater than your dependence on Him. And by dependence, I do not mean a mere verbal declaration, but to the degree that you actually seek Him and depend on Him. Saying something and being it is two very different things. So if we now look to this world to give us comfort, joy, peace, or distract us from hardship, then we may have that sense of momentary relief, but we will remain just as weak and joyless. We cannot say that he is our strength and our fortress when we do not go to him, nor hide in him. It must be a reality, and it has to be a reality now. Your disposition towards your own suffering determines whether you look to yourself, your pain, or whether you look to him. Whether you are more concerned about your pain or his purpose. We are not superhumans, but the issue for a worker and the church is that of endurance through suffering. Many will fall from the way of the faith in the time to come due to immense suffering because of famine, sickness, natural disasters, cold and persecution. 
they will feel utterly forsaken by God. How will you be a beacon of hope and light in their darkness when you yourself are unable to endure the least now? Paul said that he does not look to that which can be seen, but that which cannot be seen and is eternal. Everything of this world is based on what can be seen, but we are called to live by faith and to what is not seen and is eternal. Paul called his affliction light in comparison to the eternal weight of glory to come. He endured so much suffering and persecution, persecution, and yet he called it light. What is heavier in your life? Your suffering or the eternal weight of glory awaiting you? It's truly an immense grace to be brought authentically into the reality of this disposition towards suffering. We cannot say with Paul this light affliction if the pain is greater than the purpose. Just like the children of disobedience are storing up wrath for the day of judgment, so the obedient children of God are storing up a reward of eternal weight of glory. So there are five things that will keep us in the time to come. Number one, love that endures all things. We know that faith worketh by love. This has at its core trust in the Father. When the suffering becomes unbearable, the ability to trust Him will be crucial to endure. Number two, being apprehended by the reward of eternal weight of glory that is waiting for us. You see, Abram was mindful, no longer of Egypt, right, what Egypt represents, but of that city built without hands promised to him. So we are to see with eternal perspective everything we go through, even now. Number three, to forgive continually and guard against offense, lest our hearts grow hard. Number four, absolute dependence upon him alone. We have to ask the Spirit to show us the things we depend upon now, though he gives us friends and family, though he filled this life with beautiful and wonderful things to enjoy, they can never be our source. Not only must we be dead to this world, but the world must be dead to us. There's no life in it. Nothing at all. This has to be a reality to us. And number five, the purpose of our pain must be greater than the pain itself. Art Cut said the following, he said, to bear the pain of suffering without its redemptive understanding and its purpose is to lose its value. There's a redemptive purpose in bearing affliction coming from the hand of God. So I would like to end this devotional teaching with a word Father gave me recently. As he was guiding me in this teaching, it was by no means in the absence of suffering and heartache. And even with the finishing of this teaching, the weight and the burden of that suffering lifted. For everything there is a season and a time, and he truly makes everything beautiful in its time. My circumstances did not change, but what I did get in return is a greater capacity to endure, which is invaluable for the time to come. I pray this word inspires you to know that there is no greater honor than to know him in his suffering. Few be there who share in this that do not enjoy a closeness of his presence to the degree that the father was with his son in his greatest need. These are his friends. The word is called sharing in my suffering. I got it on the 8th of July. It's no longer about you. What you go through I use for my purposes. Your life poured out for them. Do not avoid the pain I subject you to, for in it I have a purpose. Embrace the pain so that you can hear what I say through it. Remember, it's not about you. Even your emotions are mine to use in order to express my heart. I allow these things to happen to you so that you may feel my pain. And when you do, you know my heart, and I will give you the words to speak. You cannot do this when you avoid the pain. 
You have to enter into my suffering even now. My grace is sufficient for you in your weakness to cause you to bear up under this yoke. Sharing in the yoke of my suffering, you share only in part. But as a co-laborer, we together plough through the hearts of men. Therefore, trust me that I know how much you can bear. I'm with you to teach and guide you. Come under my yoke, but also stay under my yoke. Walk in the knowing that we are one. Eat the scroll I give you. Yes, it's filled with lamentations, mourning and woes. This is the scroll of my heart. When you share in this, you share in my suffering. Can you speak it unless you embrace it? Can you embrace it unless it becomes part of you? Know that in order to speak it, you have to go through it. I've given you the understanding to perceive my sufferings, but perception is not entering. Perception is understanding. I desire that you may enter into my suffering and so be my mouthpiece to speak to my rebellious children. Though they may or will not hearken to my words, I still desire to send my prophets to speak on my behalf. It's a mercy which comes with judgment. So speak what I give you to speak, for you are only the vessel, and the vessel belongs to me. When they reject your words, they have rejected mine. When they persecute you, they have persecuted me. When they lie to you, they've lied to me. Vengeance is mine, and I will surely repay a just reward to those who scorn my mouthpiece, who have shared in my suffering. As you heap coals upon their heads, they will come and fall in shame before me and those I've chosen to speak on my behalf. I want to remind you that he told us that everything has a season and a time under heaven and that he makes all things beautiful in its time. Every season of life is determined by him and he will never prolong the suffering unnecessary. He knows what it is producing in you and also to what end and purpose. It's a time like these where you fall back on him, lean into him, and remember that nothing will separate you from his love. He promised and he said to us, you will have tribulation in this world, but be of good courage. I have overcome this world. Amen.